What does it take to make workshops work? And how can we facilitate collaboration that sticks and leads to results? My name is Miriam Hartness, and with the Workshops Work podcast, I'm on the mission to find the magic ingredients that make workshops work. Today with me on the show is Stefan Fote, and we speak about thinking tools and discuss whether or not we can facilitate other ones' thinking. So stay tuned. And by the way, If you don't have pen and paper at hand to take your own notes, scroll down to the show notes to download my free one-page summary. And now, lean back and be inspired. Hello, Stefan. Hello, Miriam. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I'm so excited that we are recording live in Melbourne. Yes, it's very exciting. And recently you told me about your thinking tools and yes. how they facilitate not conversations, but thinking Yes, it's something that I don't want to say I fell into, but I'm really grateful, if that's a thing, for COVID, for making me rework how I think about facilitation. Wonderful. And I cannot wait to dive into that. And I always start with the same question. When did you start calling yourself a facilitator? And actually, do you? <laughs> I do. But I don't get to talk about facilitation very often with clients. It's just, yes, and I do facilitation. That's great. But could you just do the thing that, whatever, you know, very outcome orientated. When did I start? So I have a background in adult learning and edu education, and I was teaching at university, but that's not facilitation. And then sort of I fell into facilitating for a nonprofit organization called Wise International. And they do leadership programs, 11 days residential for emerging leaders around the world. And that's when I started to really sort of understand what facilitation is as opposed to training, as opposed to teaching, and also as opposed to coaching. Mm -hmm. So that was about 2013, I think. And sort of since then, I'm, I'm fairly clear. Like in terms of language, I think my language is more, I don't do training, I build capability. Mm. So I lead with capability, I don't lead with facilitation, but it's really what I do. The tool or yeah. the, the skill that you're using is yeah. facilitation. Yeah. Why do you think is it not a common practice? Why wouldn't you use the term facilitation with your clients? Why don't they understand the value of it? I think it's sort of, it's not an outcome, it's a process, right? It's a way of doing things to facilitate. And I think clients in the first instance are more interested in what are you going to do for my people and with my people? So I normally lead with the outcome. And once you get over this threshold and people really ask you, how do you work if they are interested? <laughs> that's when sort of I, I go into, it's not training, it's facilitated. And this reminds me of a trap in which we often fall as entrepreneurs in general that we fall in love with our process yeah. and how we do things so much yeah. that we forget about leading with actually the problem yeah. um, and the solution that we bring and yeah. the transformation. Yeah. And very often I don't get to talk about facilitation because as soon as sort of people are clear on the outcome, they say, yeah, go ahead and do that. However you yeah, do that. Yeah. However as long you as do we that. achieve this. Yeah. Yeah. But I think for the people I work with, For them, it's really important. Mm. And probably if we ask them, they would probably have a balance of outcome and process in how they describe it. Yeah. A lot of people say, sort of safe space, I got to experiment with things, I didn't feel judged. Yes, all the things that sort of derive from facilitation. But without putting this umbrella term over yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, I get that. And I wonder, so I know that you have a background in... Consulting. Yeah. So you've been trained, air quotes, <laughs> <laughs> who is one of the big four. Um, It's Boston Consulting Group. Yeah. So what have you learned about facilitation consulting and leading with the problem and solution instead of the process from your time there? So there are two things. One is I was at BCG and I was the head of learning and development. So I look at this mm -hmm. from like two angles, right? Okay. So one is the problem-solving methodology that sort of consultants do. And the other is how I would teach this methodology. Mm -hmm. In terms of how I teach it, it's sort of you work with very smart people and they're really motivated, so that's all good. <laughs> But it's kind of you need to, 
need to understand sort of a lot of them join very young and has a lot to do with their identity. And so it's not just about learning skills. It's because it's about becoming a consultant mm. with the mindset that comes along with it, with the maturity you need to have. So I facilitate a lot for that sort of arriving in the role as opposed to just skills because mm. it's a very privileged situation because almost the skills on some level will take care of itself. But what you really want to facilitate is that they grow in the role. And when I work with more experienced consultants, for instance, my focus is often on how do you update your professional identity to where you currently are? Because once you get promoted two or three times and you still have sort of a junior mindset, but now you're leading people, mm -hmm. it's just like you're just a pain for the entire team because <laughs> you either want to do things still yourself or feel like you have to prove yourself like a junior person. Yeah. So uh, I think that's more where I create a lot of value. It's just sort of the, the context around the skills. Yeah. And I find this very interesting because I think that's a crack in many organizations, especially when they move from startup to scale up yeah. where they promote people based on their technical skills and suddenly they're managers, but they don't have the mindset, as you yeah. said yet. Yeah. How do you teach a mindset? Or I think you used the word, how do you upgrade, upgrade or up, a update? I think I said, update, upgrade. but yeah, yeah. A mindset. I think that's the outcome, right? And we, we very often, it's very easy in the world we operate in as facilitators to take the outcome for the process. Mm -hmm. And I have that a lot with change. So I steer away from a couple of words, coach, facilitator, change, <laughs> <laughs> because they mean like anything and everything to everyone. And in change, it's, it's the same, right? Like uh, leaders come to me and say, can you change the mindset of my people? Oh. And you know, like we the have to, reboot. yeah, like we have, I don't know, we have to be more end to end to be more customer centric. We have to be more integrated, less siloed, whatever it is, right? But the essence is, can you change how my people think? And as a, as a sort of, as a target description, that's fine. But when you go through the process, I always find you have to start with how people relate to their work. Mm. And if I talk to people and sort of, I want to help them sort of grow as humans, if you like, and how they relate to their work, I would sort of explore how they relate to their work why they do things, what makes them nervous, what they enjoy. And then sort of introduce, like for instance, I coach one CEO and I always ask her and she appreciates that. If the organization could talk, what would it want you to do? That's more coaching than a facilitation question, but sort of it changes the direction of thinking. Mm -hmm. And I do the same sort of with people who want to or need to step up and say, what would be the most helpful thing you can do? Mm -hmm. And very often sort of that changes the way of thinking. And through that, through that process of relating differently to the work and to yourself in the work, I think that's when you get sort of the, the more vertical or personal growth. Mm. And sort of suddenly people say, okay, I understand now that things will never settle. I have to settle. You know, like, and so it's just getting in a, a more mature relationship with what's happening. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think of facilitation of doing this with groups, you know, coaching is a lot one-on-one -on -one work, but I think this is a lot just helping people to come into good relationship with complexity. You know, I, I mean, all the things <laughs> everybody talks about all the time, yeah. but I think it's so important, like getting in, in a healthy relationship with each other, with the problem, with the organization or with, and with self. And yourself, like, uh, which is maybe the most important, actually, because if we are not okay with ourselves, we will also react yeah. weird yeah. on others. Yeah. yeah, like one of the things that I learned is sort of uh, the self leadership component of everything, right? Sort of when you, it's very easy, sort of, to act from preference in a professional context. I won't do it because I don't like it. And to have the maturity of saying, well, I don't like it, but I still understand why it happens and mm -hmm. I won't be obstructive around it. And that's even more important as you become more formally authoritative, like when you become like a manager or an executive. And it's these kinds of things that I'm really interested about, sort of how can you be mature about your role? But also, like, I think, I think a lot these days when I think about thinking tools, right? Like, what's the problems we are solving? And... The word that 
always comes back to me is the word of progress. Mm -hmm. You know, like when you talk about complex problem solving and wicked problems and all these sorts of things, systemic stuff, you don't really solve it. You make progress with it. Mm. And, but making progress with it requires such a strong self-leadership aspect because sort of you will never have the joy of finally putting it to bed. <laughs> like, because it will, done, yeah. yeah, it will always be there and yeah. you work really hard and it doesn't go away. Yeah. But sort of do you, you need to sort of within yourself find comfort in that and know your role in making progress. And I immediately think of software development. Mm. Software development, these guys are never done. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. There's always a bug, there's always an improvement, there's always an update, an upgrade, or yeah. a new thing that needs to be implemented. Yeah. And that's even sort of very tangible. So you could say, you could look at the older version and say, okay, and then the last six months, here's the progress we made. When you are in organizations, what's the progress you made with strategic thinking? Mm. It's super intangible. And kind of to give, like to give people a sense of evidence of progress mm -hmm. in the facilitation and say um because people can get really deficit orientated as we all know right mm -hmm. so it's part of my role as a facilitator to just through my questioning to just actually for them to get a sense of progress because mm -hmm. only when you have a sense of progress you get a sense of energy because we all want to be part of something growing right yeah, so you yeah, need yeah. that and then the third element to this is i think get a sense of hope which you also need from a sense of progress. Mm -hmm. And hope is a really interesting one because in German, as you would know, there is a word called Zuversicht, mm -hmm. um, which is sort of, it's not just sort of some abstract hope of belief in God, but it's sort of, it's, it's a positive outlook grounded in past experience. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what people need and that's what I try to strengthen. Yes, and then the word Zuversicht There's a, a word seeing. Sicht is yeah. vision. Yeah. So there's a yeah. clear vision, whereas hope is something yeah. abstract. Yeah. And this is something very clear. It's more grounded in optimism because you see something happen yeah. that could yeah. happen. And it's, I mean, if I look at complex organization, it's so hard to see a way. Mm -hmm. You know, like you get these, I don't know, massive targets and you don't see a way there. You don't, I don't know how we can increase by 30% this year. Yeah. And to, to see that, I think, to help participants in workshops, in retreats, whatever, help see that. Align the vision. Yeah. And to even literally, see one. Yeah. Literally yeah. the yeah. vision. And so when I think back to the thinking tool, so you as a facilitator of thinking, <laughs> and we'll come to what these thinking tools actually mean. It, what I wonder is it that you try to implement a, a similar way of approaching problems mm. and com yeah. complex issues. Yeah. Because what I realize is that many organizations claim we have to be data driven. Yeah. Yeah. We have to, <laughs> so we have to be all the things yeah. that we would assign to strategic thinking, but then How do we do that? How do we learn yeah. to read data and to draw yeah. um, decisions? Brilliant. I just have to sit upright because yes. it's kind of <laughs> getting <wet>. getting really <laughs> exciting. So because I was sort of senior at BCG around learning, executives come to me and say, can you make my people think more like strategy consultants, meaning sort of being really savvy, conscious of time, fast to output, sort of forcing trade-offs and priorities, getting decisions, all these sorts of things, right? And their problem is very few organizations have a, a shared methodology. I mean, Agile on some level does that, but mm -hmm. sort of it's more delivery focused. But if you talk more about problem solving, you go to a hospital and you talk to anesthetists, they have a way of doing things. You go to the army, they have a way of doing things. So these are sort of archetypical organizations that have a shared way of doing things. And consultants have that too, mm -hmm. but their business is project-based, high speed. And they build a business model from having their way of doing things yeah. and thinking. Yeah. So they won't give it away. Yeah. They sell you the solution and not the process. That's the yeah. difference to yeah. facilitators. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Um, and the point is, even if you would sell the process, 
the process is relatively meaningless mm -hmm. in a normal organization that's not built on project work, that doesn't have the incentives, all these sorts of things. So I tried that. And I mean, all consultancies try that, right? And teach people the methodology. My experience, that's the wrong pitch. Mm -hmm. Like I, what I did, I sort of, I break it down into more smaller things. So you could, for instance, just to make it tangible, right? You can run a day on how can you use a story of a project so then as a project management tool. So what consultants do is very early in the piece, week one, they come up with a story of what they will tell at the end. And it has holes and it's imperfect and these sorts of things. But by pushing it into a story, it gives it a narrative structure, makes it easy to engage with. It helps you protect the scope of what you do. So you drive it into inputs mm -hmm. super fast and then sort of you iterate around it and that's super successful but really complex and for a lot of people not really valuable because the stakeholder situation, the stakeholder landscape is different. They wouldn't get away with running projects like this. But what they, what for instance would help them is to say it's really helpful in a meeting when you don't come with questions but when you come with a view or what needs to happen and you get input onto this. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like when you come home and your partner says, what's for dinner? Makes like all the mental load yours, right? And you say, how about Spanish? And it's, oh, not again, Spanish. <laughs> it puts you automatically on the back foot. Now, wouldn't it be great if your partner comes home and says, what do you think of Thai? Mm -hmm. Now, by coming with a suggestion, your mental load is reduced because it allows you to be a position where you say yes or no. Mm -hmm. And it it speeds up the conversation because you can't just say no. When you say no, you need to reply. Mm -hmm. You can't just say no to Thai because the next question is, okay, what would you like? Mm -hmm. So this has its a equivalent in a lot of corporate meetings where nobody is willing to put a view forward mm -hmm. as sort of a sacrificial lamb, if you like. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's not about being right, but it's about having something on the table that we can together rip apart and make better. I love the example. Thank you so much <laughs> for making it tangible and also to bring it to private life. Yeah. And I wonder whether, and you mentioned whether it has something to do with psychological safety, actually, because as you said, <laughs> yeah. bringing an idea there to be slaughtered yeah. like a lamb requires some courage. And I'm thinking of the four stages of psychological safety by Timothy Clark, where yeah. Um, first need belonging, then you have learner safety to ask questions. Yeah. And only then, if yeah. you have, if you have safe, more safety than just asking questions, you come up with ideas. Yeah. And that's super important. And I think it's another reason why you can't just replicate consulting methodology into organizations. Uh -huh. Um, and I think it's also why these thinking tools, like, If you have them as the only person within 500, within an organization of 500, it means not much. Sort of it becomes just your personal effectiveness. But that's why I roll them out across organizations mm -hmm. so that people know this is what's coming and people know not to attack people when they come with, um, ideas. with, with ideas and not just ideas, but sort of artifacts, if you yeah. like, right? And I also train people to not get defensive around it mm -hmm. because you, sh you, you're in trouble when you identify with your suggestion, right? Like you bring your suggestion as an act of service to the other person mm -hmm. so they think better. Mm -hmm. And it's a deliberately deficit-orientated process, right? Like people might say, okay, that's a great starting point. Now let me tell you here what, what <laughs> needs to be. And, but that's how it works. And that's why it's so powerful because it's an act of service. But you need to prepare people for that to not get ripped apart or feel really bad afterwards. Yeah. So to to see it as a as a gift and not as a threat. Yeah, exactly. Just a clarifying question. When we say thinking tools, yeah. are these tools to help me think or that help the organization think or that helps us think together? Yeah. So my company is called Ownity. Mm -hmm. And Ownity is obviously a made up word and it's Ownership and unity. Mm -hmm. So it sits at the intersection of what you need to do individually and what we can do collectively. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of where a lot of problem solving sits, right? Like what do you need to do and what can we do together? Mm -hmm. And when we say leading with a view, 
as one of the thinking tools, right? Come with an idea, come with an come with a proposal. There are certain things that I need to do. I bring it, and you need to do when I brought it to you, mm. and then we can do something together. So it's about the longer tagline <laughs> is sort of making progress on messy problems, mm-hmm. like because yeah. I think that's that's what I'm really interested in. Yeah, and what I hear then is that. A thinking tool is a way of breaking down a complex problem to find one entry point and then helping or decomposing it into what do I have to do in order to start it as a kind of homework and what happens once it's kicked off, what is then in the ownership of the group? Yeah. So can you give another example? Yeah, I will. Uh, So I think there are... Some people who sell methodologies into or, or in, uh, into organizations, mm-hmm. um, project management, for instance, right, or um, lean management or Six Sigma. I think there are obviously use cases for it, and it's highly effective in these areas. But I think for most professionals, they need something else. They need sort of tools, relatively small tools, that they can use as they sort out their way through the problem. You know, like what methodologies do is they try to give you like, oh, a clear, first you do this, then you do this, mm-hmm. then you do this. I'm not sure outside of specific use cases that's super helpful. So what I try to give people something bite-sized so they can put it together for themselves as they go through it. It reminds me of liberating structures. Yeah. So you could have, so at, So what it reminds me of is how liberating structures relate to design thinking. So design thinking would be Mm. an entire methodology of flow. So you follow the individual steps. Sure, you can take the empathy step and the prototyping step individually, but it's actually one whole thing. And what liberating structures does is it offers individual activities that you can mix and match depending on the problem or topic you yeah. want to achieve. it's similar and it's kind of it's just lower threshold mm-hmm. i think in organizations it's also what i like my my theory of change is i stir up organizations <laughs> with, with these thinking tools sort of and um and the mindset that comes with it and then the word i have learned to stay away from is sort of knowledge application because it just really trivializes the whole act. So I, I focus more on experimentation. Mm -hmm. And the idea is if you, if I go into an organization with 500 people and sort of I roll out a a suite of say 10 thinking tools, right. And then across sort of three months to have people experiment with these tools. And the idea of experimentation is you're not attached to being successful. You're attached to trying. That's the measure of success. Mm -hmm. And then I trust that if 500 people try what sticks will stick sort of whatever the organization is ready to absorb will be absorbed. So it's less of a very often I find like people define the outcome and then say, okay, what do we need to do to get there? And I think that just reinforces the gap between the here and the now and the future state. Mm -hmm. And what I try to do is just look, we get there somehow. (laughs) I don't even know how, but let's start with experimenting. Two things come to my mind. One is, Focusing on an outcome is also frustrating because very often it seems like a moving goal. Yeah. Because in nowadays problems, we're never there. It, everything is kind of like a software yeah. that constantly continues to change. Yeah. And we used to use waterfall in yeah. project management where everything is laid out and we know exactly what we have to do. But by yeah. the time we arrived, everything yeah. is outdated. So it's basically teaching or finding a new way of looking at the problem and interacting with each other. Yeah. And I think also looking, you know, the example with software is really interesting. And I think it's easy sort of to take a mental model from software development and put it onto people. Mm -hmm. But people are not software. (laughs) You know, yeah, you tell people five times, this is not good enough. They quit. You're like, uh, not like this, but you know, like, but when you, when you iterate on software, you don't need to consider the human nature or how human change works. Yes. Can I draw a quick tangent? <laughs> Go for it. Because, so I had a podcast interview with ChatGPT, right? 
and had a conversation with a previous podcast guest about this <laughs> podcast <laughs> interview. And what we realized is that in order to get information from software, from AI, we have to be very precise and we can tell it to iterate that it's not good enough a yeah. million times and yeah. it will get better. Yeah. And on the one hand, we learn to be very precise and we wish that sometimes with humans we would give as distinguished yeah. answers like, as an AI, I cannot answer this question, but here is what I can answer. Yeah. And we wish that we would have this rapid feedback with hmm. humans um, because we take all the emotions and attachments out. Yeah. Two stories come to my mind. One is when I work with junior consultants and you sort of have them role play client interviews and you task them with sort of finding out some, some data or whatever, some context, it's really natural to treat the other person as sort of a mystery machine <laughs> and you have to get the data out. <laughs> you know, like, and it gets really mechanical. So that's really interesting, sort of, as opposed to just letting people talk. And the other thing is, when you iterate on content, right, the, it's deliberately deficit orientated. You don't really spend much time on making it, saying what's great about it, but you go to what's missing, what's missing what else could you do, how could you go deeper, is this really helpful for your audience? And that's sort of iterating on content is very, very different from giving humans feedback. And a lot of people who work in an iterative environment struggle with that because no matter how good their proposal is, it comes back with red ink, even if it's great, right? But it just means it helps people to make it even greater. So if they infer from the red ink, mm -hmm. they did a bad job, they will always feel like they did a bad job. Yes. And at the same time, so it's really, it's a catch 22 because when I get a piece of work to comment it, to give yeah. feedback. I want to add value yeah. to the work, but also to my own time. So yeah. it's cognitive dissonance, kind of, I want to be a good person, but and therefore I want to use my red ink, although I know that this might be frustrating for the other person. Yeah, what you need is the majority to separate out iteration and feedback and mm -hmm. say, I give you this back and you see a lot of red, but actually it was really good. It helped me, like what you really did was you unlocked something for me and that's when the red ink came. Plus you don't need to take <laughs> red ink, right? Uh, but <laughs> makes it less dramatic. Yeah, one. makes it less dramatic. But, you know, like that's what I mean when I say maturity, right? To say me giving a suggestion to you allows you to make things easy and I expect it to be red. Mm -hmm. And I need to separate out the red ink from whether or not I did a good job. Mm. I need to ask you, hey, Miriam, what did that do for you? Was that helpful? And then you say, yeah, I thought it was great. It really helped me to push even further than I would otherwise. Or you might say, well, it was a bit sloppy because here and here and here. So, But it's the maturity to not sort of take from input into your work for this to be feedback on your performance. But these are the kinds of things that we need to become better at. I have a similar thing with tension. Like a lot of people equate tension with conflict mm. and you feel like, hold on, like we need to have the maturity to see there's a systemic tension. So if there is no tension between your chief marketing officer and your chief finance officer, mm. something is wrong. Something is wrong. And you can perfectly like each other, right? But kind of your work is set up to be in tension with each other and that's Haha, uh -huh, intentional. Um, but <laughs> I've never thought of yeah, that. But you yeah. know, there are like systemic tensions in a, in an organization. And that's how the big picture fits together. But if people want to get out of tension, it will be diametrical to, if they want out of good tension, yeah. right, it will be diametrical to the actual sort of intention. Yeah. And the, <laughs> yeah. And the value creation, right? So what's the tension you need to hold? What's the good one? what are the distortions you can do to good tension then it becomes toxic mm -hmm. when you make things personal so i think that's another it just gets me sort of when you spoke about maturity yeah it's and, another um, example we are opening a lot of boxes yeah. <laughs> so each, each of these boxes yeah. could be a rabbit hole and put feedback on on the list to come yeah. back to it i find it fascinating with the tension and Thank you for the reminder, because we often forget how important the tension is, yeah. and especially in the workshop. It's all about tension release, tension release, yeah. because without tension, there is no 
aha moment. Yeah. There's no, and it's in the release and the, ah, oh, yeah. that the learning happens. And still, I think many would now sit in the audience and nod and like, yes, of course. And still we're taking it personal. So, yeah. and I think it's also a matter of, yes, maturity. It's a matter of culture yeah. and it's a matter of personality and personal yeah. preferences. To what extent do I feel comfortable with tension, maybe even playful with tension? Yeah. Or am I a people pleaser? I have a yeah. tendency to people please. And then I don't like tension, even though I know that it's needed. So what would be your trick or your hack hashtag thinking tool or a workaround to make sure that an organization grows into this maturity to understand the value of this tension? There's different value in the different roles that people play. Like a people pleaser plays a very valuable role as long as it fits within the bigger picture, right? And I would say everyone has a role to play in making a system successful. And some of the roles come easier to us and some of us require to step more into something that's difficult to us. And I always use the example of extroverts and introverts in meetings, right? Mm -hmm. So for introverts, the job is sort of to speak up more and to put themselves out. And for extroverts, it's kind of to just pause their own processing through talking and do a bit more listening or something, something like this, right? It's all very stereotyping. But my point is sort of we all are on a journey to playing a role with good tension and our, our journey is different. So my journey to good tension is different from yours. Mm -hmm. And I just have to find my own, right? And when I, when I facilitate that, I always try to facilitate on this meta level and say, what do you personally need to do in order to unlock your next level with good tension? Mm -hmm. And people will say different things, right? People will say massively different things. But as a facilitator, I don't really care for... What I care about is that everybody has something that they work on with a shared goal. What that is can be very different. Mm. Something will happen <laughs> in my brain this intention, being yeah. intention yeah. with each other, intentionally intention, yeah. and how to facilitate this process. Because I think it's also, and I don't want to go too deep and into the personal history space, but depending on how we relate to conflict. I find it always fascinating to speak with friends or even in groups on what is our relationship to conflict from a family. How have we dealt with conflict in families? Because for instance, in my family, we love and we hate each other very loudly. <laughs> so conflict means, yes, we can shout at each other, but it never means that we don't love each other. Yeah. And it never means a breakup. Whereas for others... Shouting at each other could mean a breakup or could mean yeah. letting someone down. I think that's why I love working in groups because that's what you bring out in what I might not bring it out, but it naturally comes out, yeah. right? When people say, well, for me, it's actually just accepting that not everybody does conflict like I do, right? Yeah. Or my household would be a great insight for, for the group to hear. Another one sort of where listening to you sort of takes me is sort of, for instance, the illusion of alignment, <laughs> I like this like is such a a phrase of like we have to be aligned as an organization. And I just did the same thing. You say illusion of alignment. I say yes, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I laugh, assuming that I know what you mean. Yeah. Actually I don't know yeah. because you're a black yeah. box. Yeah. <laughs> Very true. But sort of I always find it interesting, right? Like senior leaders introduce tension into the organization. In the way of saying, we, we are currently here, we have to be here. Let's sort this out. Mm -hmm. And then the next level down specifies that a bit and says, okay, in my bit, here's what we can do to close the gap, but I don't really know how it comes together, but let's see, I talk to my people. And so it cascades through the organization. And if you aren't aware of the tension that sits between that, that, yeah. um, that a senior executive goes to their team and say, here, I introduce a challenge to you. That's the gap we need to close. And nobody knows yet how. So, and then sort of you work together to close the gap. That's a tension between where we are and where we need to be and nobody seeing how we get there. And you see dysfunctional strategy getting out of the tension. 
right? You see it from leaders who take it all on themselves to, I need to like tell my team what to do. Micromanagement. Yeah. Or you see it from the team and say, well, I can't do anything here until you tell me what to do. So it's also seductive. Or even um, outsourcing the problem and say, okay, yeah. we don't trust the organization to do it themselves. So yeah. let's call some consultants to solve it for us. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, all of this is just ways of deflecting out of the tension. Avoiding. Fantastic avoiding strategies. Yeah. And then I wonder <laughs> to what extent we can actually really focus on thinking without also looking at the feeling. Because yeah. avoiding tension yeah. is a feeling yeah. problem. Yeah. That goes to the heart of one of my pains. <laughs> It's so hard to find language to describe sort of the direction I'm working. I once did a program a couple of years ago in a bank and we called it entrepreneurial thinking. Mm -hmm. Went so wrong because sort of everybody came and said, I make them an entrepreneur. But it's not. It's just sort of we, what we wanted to do is sort of capture this mindset of making a contribution, being proactive, being savvy, sort of being mindful of everybody's time, being smart, how you collaborate, all these sorts, all the things we've been talking about, right? Being mature and understanding systemic things around you. And I really struggle to come up with a good word. So if everybody out there has a good phrase, I'm all, I'm all ears. And I came up with thinking tools, but it's not to dismiss emotions. Indeed, when I, when sort of I map out my framework, it's the, um, I already said sort of I think about it as unity and ownership, mm -hmm. sort of the individual and the collective. And the other dimension we need to integrate is emotional intelligence and strategic perspective. Mm -hmm. So I can use my emotional intelligence in all of this to my own benefit. Mm -hmm. right? Like I can be really good at relationships and I make my life easy for that. I can be really good at managing myself and I make this to my own advantage. But the thing is, I think the future is how can we use emotional intelligence in pursuit of what's strategically important? Because this is where our advantage over AI sits. AI is better in all the strategic stuff yeah. than we will ever be. But it's about the interrelations yeah. that how can it go wrong because of human things yeah. Yeah. and tension yeah. that will never be solved by AI. So we yeah. have to learn that. Yeah. And sometimes mm. I do some work with sort of non-for-profit and for-purpose organizations and Like for people to sort of understand where an organization needs to go in order to sort of fulfill best its vision and the grief that can come from this because it needs to grow or it needs to change or it needs to let go. You're like, you need, I want to say leaders, but it's actually everyone to sort of have the maturity of saying, well, I understand that and I have some grief around it. And here is how collectively we can, can work through the grief because We want to work through the grief because it's for the advancement of our mission mm -hmm. that we do that. You know, like, but it's it's kind of it's it's not just you don't convince people by saying that's that's where we need to go. That's where the mission is best. You you convince people by doing that and helping them through the grief, wrestling with this on some questions. And I, before the grief comes closure, and I I don't remember who it was, but I. I spoke with one of the podcast guests about the lack of closure in change processes, mm. that constantly organizations come with new ideas, new yeah. things, new implementations. So there's constantly change and newness, but there's never closure of something. Yeah. And if, there's, if it's not officially closed, how can you grieve? And it comes back that humans are not computer programs or software. <laughs> <laughs> right, you know, like, but it's yeah. exactly the same yeah. thing. Yeah. It's kind of we need to consider what people need in order to follow. And I always I find it really interesting. Like, you have this whole movement of adaptive leadership, mm -hmm. right? So, but who actually sort of equips people to be adaptive followers? And that's sort of what I try. It's not what I lead with, but it's what I try to do. Right? Kind of, you have leaders who've been to Harvard or whatever any business school, right? And they they're aware of things change and. It, not just technical solutions, what what have you, but in organizations at mass, are mm -hmm. people adaptive in following and what do they need in order to be adaptive to follow? Beautiful tension. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking of, of responsibilities and I'm thinking of dancing. Mm -hmm. So in order, so what can the adaptive leader do 
to facilitate following. Yeah. Because changing directions every day, maybe because they are needed or they're brilliant, doesn't help if hmm. nobody sees, nobody understands, or to assume that yeah. the followers, air quotes, are, um, are machines. So there's a responsibility there, but then there's also responsibility in the follower to, and that's why I'm thinking of a dance. You have the leader yeah. who who sends the signals, but you have the follower who needs to have a clear frame in order yeah. to receive the signals. I would even go one step further and say a dance is a relatively controlled endeavor. I always think more about adventures where you have massive risk involved. You know, like a couple of years ago, there was a lot about people talking about journeys, mm -hmm. customer journey, like whatever journey, right? And, and then journey became just commonplace for just plan. But if you go on a journey, and even more so on an adventure, you don't know exactly what happens. You don't know how to suss it out. That's what makes an adventure. But in corporate logics, there's no place for adventure, which is also, by the way, you don't need hope. <laughs> But to do an adventure, you need hope. But it's... And so Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of, we are in this together. How can we make this work? Mm -hmm. And not to expect of each other to have all the answers or to not needing anything in order to just perform. Like it's really sort of taking care of each other and having the responsibility. Because if you look closely, the power very often doesn't sit with senior people, but with people on the ground who are solve the problems the who have insights the executive power yes yeah the direction yeah. of strategic yeah. power is nice. yeah. and that's another tension yeah right just deciding that it will be different yeah. doesn't mean that it will de facto be different yeah. yeah it sounds like a chicken and an egg problem so how to facilitate an organizational rethinking you just get started so in my experience like what i try to do is i have 50 thinking tools, right? Sort of, so sort of that encapsulate the mindset in different aspects, sort of meetings, stakeholder engagements, self-leadership, self-management, presenting well, writing storylines, all these sorts of things. And then sort of you curate something where you say, okay, what are the 10 that would give you the biggest unlock? I always think unlock is a really important word because growth, we sometimes plan out growth which is ludicrous, right? <laughs> I would say it's a much better mental model of saying, what do I need to unlock for you to literally explode in creativity? I can't plan your creativity, but mm -hmm. I can hone in on what are the unlocks. So I asked my clients, okay, what are the 10 tools we got for the toolkit that would unlock your people? And then we sort of build a program around this in the organization with, with their context. Most clients don't call it thinking tools, they call it something else. And before getting into the yeah. process. Because <laughs> there is one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I, I trust. I'm wondering, the, how do we know what there is to unlock? For instance, yesterday I won my first half marathon. Hey! Yay! And half a year ago, I thought that I am incapable of running longer than 10 kilometers in a row. Yeah. Until someone asked me, have you ever tried? Yeah. I realized, yeah. no. So what did I have to unlock to make this happen was clearly my belief system, my limiting beliefs. And then I realized that I have to build the muscles. Yeah. So these would be two things that what I hear in your story of the unlocking. Yeah. How do you find that in, a, in an organization? I find we have to sort of be mindful not to get too far ahead of ourselves. So I always think like, What would unlock the next level for you? Mm -hmm. Even if leaders want you to be five levels unlocked, like what's the next thing? So if we go back to running, right, I would not say what, what would unlock you to run a marathon mm -hmm. at the moment, right? You did a half, like I could be a leader and I say, well, Miriam, within the next two years, you really need to work a, a marathon because we need you to fundraise. Do this, this year. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, like, I would say, What would unlock you staying connected with running this distance? Mm. Like, or what would be your next level? So not to aim too far, but to say, okay, let's get going. And ask the person who is actually affected instead of defining the goals. Yeah, if possible. But even sort of with senior people, sort of to just say, okay, well, I hear that's where you want to go in two years. But sort of, What's really the next thing? What would be one or two things where you would say, well, we get this over the next couple of months, that would actually make a difference. Mm -hmm. 
And then it starts sounding really benign, right? More effective meetings or more putting the customer at the heart of our conversations or whatever it is. So just breaking it down into step changes as opposed to at the end, where do you want to be? Yeah. And then for the running, it would mean having a clear schedule, keeping my my gender clear in the morning so that I can run daily, keeping myself injury free. Yeah. These are the things you can control. Because if we talk about complex organizations. Things you can control. Yeah. And complex organizations, like who can ultimately predict an organization of 500 people? how change will play out systemically. I can't, and I don't pretend I can. So, But what I can say is put the right things in place, get going with the right qualities, and keep accountability to that, and you grow from there. Is it then a kind of pain analysis that you look at where is or the, yeah. the Achilles of the, orga- where's yeah. the, Achilles yeah. of the organization, yeah. the Achilles yeah. of the runner, yeah. right? Exactly. And I, I don't just rely on people telling me. I also sort of... Just try to understand every organization its own beast, right? <laughs> you know, like I, I work with some organizations that play games about data. Say so if they don't want to make a decision, they just ask for more data. <laughs> so you need to build maturity around that. Other organizations are very mission-driven. Sort of people invest a lot. So if you have this component of how do you be pragmatic when you invest so much, like they all like have invested a lot like of, the, of their lives in sort of opportunity cost and all these sorts of things. So you need maturity on how to deal with that. So I try to understand an organization and listen to people and what they want and then sort of recurate something that's digestible. Like I always think that's the most important thing, like 10 tools. And when I introduce them to people, people always feel like, what the heck? I know all of this. And then I tell them, it doesn't matter if you know them, right? The question is, are we collectively doing them? Mm. And that's when we start working. Um, I'm thinking of an interview I currently had with Pauline about play. And I asked mm. her for her definition of play. And she said, it's basically enjoying what you do. Yeah. So work becomes, so her mission is to turn work into play, just as this mind t- set shift and i hear a similar thing in what you just described how can you change the thing that you're doing to make it easier and maybe feel like play yeah i'm i'm german so i struggle with play (laughs) (laughs) no just kidding but it's indeed sort of it's not my dominant lens but i think you can view it that way sort of to be light with it i Mm -hmm. would say because ultimately Who knows, right? It's similar with play. Yeah, and ultimately, when we're looking at sustainable change, behavioral change, we cannot force it unless we want it. And we only want it if it's... And it's a matter of progress, as you said, right? So it's incremental change. And we can only keep going if it's somehow fun. Yeah, and I think my take on this is everybody wants to be something that's growing. Mm. And... So people want to stay developing if they feel like they're growing. People want to stay in organizations that are growing. And I don't just mean financially, right? But Mm -hmm. sort of in whatever way they are growing and to have an awareness around their growth. But, and I guess that's just a different way of sort of the argument with the playfulness. But I think it's just what keeps people engaged. And there's, um, I think it was Teresa Amabil who wrote a book, The Process Principle, Mm. where she shows that there's one single determinator for someone being engaged at work. It's a sense of meaningful progress. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's exactly it, right? Like how can you, in the depth of really complex projects, not give up? Mm. <laughs> you know, like you had like your, your next retro and what have you and strategic agenda is changing again and it's the third wave of change in the last three years and there's a new IT system. How can you sort of just not give up? Resilience, organizational yeah. resilience. Yeah. Mm. And I think it's, it's again, sort of the ownership and the unity aspect of it. So everybody has to take a, a part of this, yeah. but also organizations have to do something about it together, collectively. Yeah. Yeah. That's a big challenge. Mm. How not to give up because I think many yeah. are just frustrated, especially now after coming out of the pandemic, before it was already difficult, then there was a pandemic and now there's again change. Yeah. I think as I was preparing for this, I thought... There's one thing sort of that struck me in 2020 when everybody was on video calls 
the difference between being visible and being seen. Like everybody was super visible, right? And people suffer from that because they saw themselves on camera all day and become self-aware. But the sad thing is that while we were all visible, we weren't seen mm -hmm. in our attempts and our struggles into our victories, right? We were ultimately alone despite sort of the illusion of visibility. Unless we were intentional about showing it. Yeah. Yeah. And there are only that many yeah. of us who actually have the yeah. gut to show it. And that's why, like, facilitating throughout COVID, the easiest trick in the book was sort of to just see people, to just acknowledge them and see them. Yeah. Because that was such a, a need and a desperation for it. Mm -hmm. Yes. And maybe this is one key to success now is coming back to the office to keep this because I heard stories now of people coming back to the office and ignoring each other in the hallways. Yeah. So yeah. really just being on autopilot and not interacting with their peers and their colleagues because they lost the habit of doing that and then not being seen in the physical space. That's painful. It's even worse than not being yeah. seen in the... And it requires sort of us facilitators to help with that, right? To yeah. facilitate processes where people can reconnect to their innate abilities to do that. How might we? As always, I think it's starting simple. <laughs> yeah, just getting together, sharing. I still ask people, I, I had a, a senior leadership retreat just the other day. So we're out of, co not out of COVID, but you know, like normal lockdowns and these sorts of things. And I asked them just to share with hybrid work, what's their context at home? How did they set themselves up? What's really working for them? What do they consciously need to work with because it's attention? And it was amazing. Like just for people to share and to listen. I think it's also like all time classic and always like listening exercises because we like there's so much selective listening that goes on in Zoom calls mm -hmm. as opposed to really sort of being with someone, just learning about the person. I think just virtual meetings for all their advantages sort of can take away some of our best skills. Yes. And I think the relating it to your private life. So showing a piece of your non-corporate self to yeah. each other without it being too risky. So how do you deal with a hybrid yeah. um, environment? What do you have to adjust to? What are the tensions at home? I think it's a brilliant question because everyone can relate to that and then we can relate to each other in our humanness yeah yeah i think there was a lot of focus on just getting on with the work mm -hmm. and now we need to sort of take some of our blinkers off because suddenly the the potential is back to what it was the potential of being creative together thinking big thinking long term not Like if you talk about sort of tension, right, and holding tension, you hold creative tension in the room physically mm. easier, longer, more productively than on a three-hour Zoom call. And I, I wonder whether this is true. And I'm relating this to the hashtag silent quitting and to something that you mentioned earlier, this feedback, feedback piece, feedback yeah. thinking tool. And I wonder whether throughout the pandemic and working from home lockdown, we have unlearned to actually sit long enough with mm. attention. Yeah. And it's easier to just log off, blame the internet, choose the flight instead of the fight yeah. mode, which is, I think, not constructive in the end. Yeah, it's on some level self-harming, right? Yes, yes. Sort of, we cannot run away all the time. Yeah, yeah. And so how do you reintegrate? So what would be an easy hack to help to facilitate teams to reestablish this feedback culture and not run away when it gets complicated. I mean, what I do is just bring them together and we learn together. It, I think it's such a, like learning together is such a low threatening activity. Mm -hmm. And you just get people in a room together, even if it's hybrid, and you just take time to learn together, to think together, to share how we do things, what, what comes easy to us, what doesn't come easy to us. And I often let people sort of self-select the level of depth of sharing they want to do because I don't know where people are at. <laughs> yeah. And then towards the end, you just sort of help them to see the evidence of their progress throughout the session. 
So this would mean that if there is a feedback issue in a team, yeah. let's come together and learn about feedback. And then in small groups, they do the research about feedback tools and constructive feedback or share what kind of feedback they enjoy. Yeah. And then sharing it. Yeah. And then sort of, I'll probably give them a simple feedback framework to, to practice rather than just talking about it. And then to help them, okay, how would that feedback framework help with their challenge? which is a subtle way of just surfacing their challenge without focusing on it. Mm. And then sort of let it consolidate. And then at the end, to take the collective lens and say, okay, so what's the journey we are on with feedback? It sounds like the process of your thinking tools. You give them, yeah. and maybe I'm assuming, <laughs> you give them a framework. You ask them to apply it on their own, yeah. on their personal issue, and then to share it with the collective, with the team. Yeah, absolutely. I think... I'm probably really biased. <laughs> it's, the thing, it's the thing that COVID taught me, right? When you have an hour, like I work with lots of organizations who said, instead of half a day work trip, you have an hour with our team. Mm. They said, oh, great. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so I'm thinking a lot sort of, it made my thinking much more focused on efficiency and effectiveness. But I think ultimately it's not about the tool. It's about how you plan on using it and how it can help you to unlock something. Mm. And I think it's the same when you get into conversation about feedback. It's not the feedback. It's what do we need to enable for each other? It needs to be safe. It needs to be constructive because we want to go somewhere. Like It needs to be respectful. So I think that's why I'm actually the wrong person to do tools. Or I, I'm the wrong, I might be the right person, but I'm a real tool skeptic because mm -hmm. I feel like people want hacks, right? And yeah. what, what I give is tools that help you to grow as a person. Mm -hmm. And they just look like professional tools. <laughs> but I think ultimately, sort of, it's the maturity and around feedback as well. It's so funny that you're saying this, the tension between the professional and the personal learning. Yeah. And I realized that was uh, never done before. The community that I host, most of the members joined because of professional growth. I yeah. want to learn and deepen my yeah. facilitation skills. And they all stay because of personal yeah. growth. <laughs> and and that, because that's the real kind of motivator. Yeah. For most of us. And I think it's interesting you say that. And I think when it comes to, when you touch the realm of personal growth, I think we as facilitators have a real responsibility to not be intrusive. And that's why, like, I always tell people, I don't know if any of these tools work for you. You are the expert of your context. So what we want to do is just explore if and how they could work for you. And if you say at the end, this was not helpful, I will apologize for wasting your time. But it's kind of like, if it gets personal, people need to be in control. And if we talk about conflict, right, I just can't march in and say, like, you know, be intrusive on how people should do conflict. I have to be really careful and need to give people ownership over the process, not so much the process, but where they are, their own, their own process, not the facilitation yeah. process, but their own process, because otherwise I just perpetuate the problem. And otherwise it doesn't feel safe. Yeah. If yeah. it gets personal, people yeah. need to be in control yeah. because otherwise, yeah. of course they will want to run away. Yeah. And I have to like, mm. what I really learned is sort of being judgmental, like some uh, non-judgmental. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Um, no, it's kind of like, like every behavior, every behavior is rational. Mm -hmm. It might not be functional, but it's rational. Yeah. So there's a logic to why people do the way they do it. So I have no right to question the the rationality of the doing. I can work with them on sussing out if it's functional or not, but that's different than saying that's crap. Yes, because they will find their own rationale for their behavior. Yeah. So yeah. at least for them it makes sense, maybe not for yeah. us. Yeah. And it's always about agency. Like just last two weeks ago, I ran a workshop on accountability. And we spent time on that it's actually not about the key is not holding someone to account. The key is the other person letting you to hold them to account. Because if they don't, you will not hold them to account. They will deflect the hell out of it. They know that was because of Frank of IT didn't do their gig. You know, like yeah, you yeah. go like uh, below the line. Mm -hmm. So the key with accountability is do you allow someone else and yourself to hold yourself to account. This is so true.
And that's why I always feel like your agency, your, like you know your context. I'm not telling you what to do, right? I have something that works for a lot of people and BCG and what have you, I have my spiel. <laughs> you know, my spiel, but it's kind of ultimately, it's your choice. Yeah. And it's, that's why I'm saying experiment because you need to suss it out for yourself. Your context is too complex for me to come in and say, here's what you need to do. Mm -hmm. I help you to find your unlocks but I can't find them for you. Yeah. Brilliant. And I think that's, that's also facilitation superpower to facilitate a group and individuals to do something without telling them what to do. Yeah. Because at the end, I mean, I'm the first of all, don't tell me what to do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's professional, <laughs> professional hazard. I'm the same. Uh, yeah. yeah. And still we want, I had a amazing conversation with another facilitator the other day, about exactly that. How often do we ask people what to do or tell them what to do? Close your eyes now. And then, well, we talked about how this can bring up previous trauma and we don't know, but we're telling them to close their eyes. Or <laughs> another one recently got triggered by more and more facilitators telling the group to breathe. Yeah. Like, don't tell me to breathe. Yeah. So yeah. what is it? How can we give them the agency to choose and still holding structure? I think that's the... Yeah. And it's interesting, right? Like I talked about more after after session what people take, but I think it's also true what you say with in sessions, mm -hmm. the process in sessions. And I mean, that's why it's such a great um, sort of job full of privilege. And it's a real privilege to get close to people and to be mindful to not step on toes. You work like on, on really sensitive areas sometimes without knowing it. And you have to be ready to admit failure, of the just, and apologize. And generally, sort of, I think one of my mentors sort of was always like, "Do no harm," as a first <laughs> as a first principle. Yeah. Do no harm. Do no harm. And I think it comes from a really cool place of, as like, believe in people. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't need to kick your butts into action. You know? yeah. <laughs> it comes from a neg very negative sort of picture of what human how humans operate but to say well do do no harm and create something positive and people want to be part of it and yeah. join join in yeah what makes a workshop fail according to you can be many things i think really many things it depends sort of failing as in process breakdown failing as in we don't achieve our objectives right mm -hmm. and it's uh, in terms of process breaking down i think I just go through <laughs> experience after experience. No, it's sort of lots of lots of things can happen. Like you can't ground the people. There might be something else in the system that you're unaware of. All these sorts of things. I think more common for me is sort of, I don't want to say workshops don't fail, but I think when you're open in what you want to achieve and you see the positive in in things, it's kind of more like, okay, we didn't get to where we wanted to go. But Let's look at the meaning that we got from that. Mm. So mm -hmm. I struggle with the question because I think you always make some progress. And that's sort of the majority of the concept of progress. Two things come to my mind. One is about responsibility. Who is responsible for a potential failure yeah. and um, process breakdown? And the other one is how much time do we then make for learning? Yeah. Because I was just thinking of the situation that you meant, okay, if at least there was some sort of learning, yeah. then there's no failure. But if we don't allow time to actually admit, debrief, reflect on what yeah. has happened in the room, but everyone leaves being puzzled, frustrated, yeah. angry. Yeah, I think it's kind of, if you can call a failure 80% into a workshop, that's really good. Because then you have 20% to talk about it, <laughs> like to make sense of it, to make meaning yeah. of it, and to sort of get closure on it. I think the hardest thing is when you can't drive it into action at the end or into alignment. And then sort of to, and then you have like two minutes left and say, okay, what narrative can I offer to the, because I don't have time to evoke, like to get a narrative with them. What's the narrative I can offer to an audience is super hard. Interesting. Yeah. And this for me, would be an example where the responsibilities were the facilitator. Yeah. So how can they make sure that there's more time than just two minutes 
to yeah. bring it to a closure yeah. Yeah. and to have alignment or at least the next step. Yeah. And uh, I think it's a lot of team coaching that comes in there. I remember like in my team coaching, so for me, sort of it, it blends, right? But sort of in team coaching, what you learn is sort of to keep a real eye on the, not just the process that you run, but the process that the group goes through mm. and mm -hmm. kind of to just relate to this and to sort of have meta conversations about it. And like, are we going where we want to go? Are we having the right conversations? If not, like what's, what's stopping us right now? Yeah. But yeah, so I, I think without this, it gets really easy to be attached to process your own process, your own sort of running a process mm -hmm. of just sort of getting through something and needing to get somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. And it comes with that. I mean, it's also, I mean, I know that lots of people listen to, to the podcast sort of, of different levels of experience. And I think that's one of the things as you become more senior, where you can actually then after a workshop, go to your sponsor and say, we didn't get what we got to, but I think it was still meaningful for those reasons. Mm. And that's not a, and the trick is to own that genuinely, right? Like it's not an excuse, but it's kind yeah. of, look, we share, like oh, without saying this, we share this responsibility and I really couldn't push harder. Yeah. And you cannot force an outcome. It's yeah. not in your hands. You can just facilitate the process or create yeah. the opportunities, the ways. And for me, and this is then also where the responsibility for the group comes in, that if they have the impression that it goes in a direction where it deviates or where they're not getting what they need in order to align and yeah. to come to a conclusion. They also have to voice it to the facilitator. Yeah. That something is going wrong. And you see. And not just zoning out and yeah. answering the emails. And you see funky dynamics between groups and facilitators, right? It's like if as a facilitator, you push too hard, I'm always wary that you undermine responsibility because then they say, well, I only said yes because I was pushed. Mm. You know, like kind of, it's really easy. Yeah, it's really easy for us to sort of crank up the heat, but it, it comes at the price of, well, actually, I didn't mean it. It was just, I felt pressured. Yeah. What remains your number one facilitation challenge? I think it's, it's intercultural stuff. And also, like, I, I coached, for a couple of years, I coached um, a woman from Kuwait, which is really fascinating because you coach from really far behind because i can only relate to her on a human level right i can't relate to her on a gender level on a cultural level we could relate on an or we did relate on an age level but so you have to be really mindful of what are your assumptions and you facilitate from really deep place or, because you don't really know what's possible for someone and i find this was really instructive for me sort of my own assumptions about the world, about what someone should do, not do, <laughs> what's possible. Yeah. You know, like, it's kind of, it's an ongoing journey. And I mean really journey because it's kind of, you need hope that people hear you and understand you and vice versa. And that's not all, you can't always control that. So I think that's something I'm really working And it's different cultures, it's different genders, different age groups. Uh, working so it's just sort of getting beyond my own little personal context and that's all the visible stuff then yeah. you have all the invisible stuff which yeah. is company culture yeah. industry culture yeah past experiences yeah. and i think sometimes my challenge is also now that will sound very meta but to retreat too much mm -hmm. and sort of to sort of to overemphasize that i don't know and therefore can't say so sometimes it's also in service of the process to take a calculated risk and to signpost it as such, right? Look, I don't know how this speaks to you, but from what I hear, it looks to me almost like as if, you know, just like to... Stating something. Yeah, to sort of as a calculated risk to help people advance their own thinking and to push them. Because if you overemphasize too much yeah. that you don't understand anything, you don't create a healthy tension. <laughs> yes, which is funny because it brings us full circle yeah. to where our conversation started, right? Yeah. That in a team, it helps to take the risk of stating something, yeah. uh, to, to suggest where to eat for dinner <laughs> instead yeah. of asking. And yes, I think for the facilitator, I wonder why, well, no, I don't wonder why. I think it's safe 
to lead with questions and the I don't know. Is it always the best? And because maybe there's still a lot of misunderstanding about what neutrality means. Yeah. And I think, and that's what I hear from you, as long as it's in service to the group mm. and not just us showing off, look yeah. at what I know. Yeah. I think it's super like helpful to share observations and suggestions as long as you signpost them properly mm. and you allow the group to tell you're wrong. Yeah. Right? I think that's super important. And for that to happen, you ha need to have created this safety, hmm. openness with yeah. the group. Yeah. And it's a weird kind of, it's hard, it kind of, there's no hack to learn it if you like, because you also, people also resonate with you to be grounded in that. So you yeah. can't fake it. Yeah. Like you can't fake it. Sort of it comes from when it goes wrong, are you willing to, to own it in a mature way? Yeah. And that comes unfortunately with experience. Yeah. The tension between authority and humility. Yeah. Because as a facilitator, you do have authority. You do tell people what to do. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> we find better ways to do that, but still we have a process and we got yeah. through that. And then to, to give them the opportunity to flip that and criticize or at least mm. question or challenge the facilitator and authority that yeah. requires the group to feel safe and the facilitator yet to own yeah. it, as you say. And then the masterclass to that is if one or two people in the group criticize you to not react to that, yeah. but to, to widen it and say, okay, is that a, is that a sentiment that the group shares? Yeah. So it's kind of to localize it. Is it just one or two people? Is it the group? So to do that before you jump into responding, because I've seen that sort of where one person doesn't like it is, is sort of um, loud about it. And then sort of facilitator reacts. So mm. kind of to broaden it. And that's that's kind of mm. that's not easy because you're under pressure, you're on the spot. And to say, okay, hold on, let me just get this straight. And then to find a way that people make it safe for people to find a way to tell you if they agree with that, or also if they don't agree with a member of their group, which yeah. also requires some risk, right? Yeah. So yeah. to stay calm in that heat, because it makes a material difference if you have a group that doesn't like what you do, which means you need to react or you need to respond, you need to do something about it. Or if you have one or two people. And who these people are. Yeah. Are these the leaders of yeah. the rest or are these participants? Yeah. Team members? Yeah. And yes. also what's the meaning of them speaking up, right? Mm -hmm. Some people are just critical and they make a living out of being critical. And so some people, that's a real risk they take yeah. to share that. So there's a lot going on in the moment. And I always find that's the beauty of our job is kind of to, to dance with that and sort of, to sort of, to be fast without being rushed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And to act without reacting. Yeah. And I think, yeah, I think that's really one of the high arts of how to act when someone voices mm. criticism during a facilitated process. Yeah. And they might not talk to you, right? They might talk to the past. If, if, like if someone criticizes you for asking them to close their eyes, yeah, you just have to acknowledge, okay, that's not me. I mean, there is something about you which is, okay, was I attentive enough? Should mm. I have done this? But park that because <laughs> we are off, very often we're just a vessel. Yeah. And what people react to is just something else. I think 99% of the cases, yeah. Um, yeah. even outside the workshop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like we hear we hear things that are totally unrelated to the person who's speaking to us. Yeah. Uh, and then project. Yeah. Yeah, that's where the inner game comes. Mm -hmm. Acknowledging that. One of the best things I heard was um that was about coaching, but I think it's similar to facilitation when someone so a senior leader in an organization and uh she said the first question to ask any executive coach is how much work on self have you done? And I think it's the same with facilitators mm -hmm. right like how much work on self have you done because to your point about authority right if you don't have a healthy relationship with authority you might be a pain yeah. you're like yeah. and that goes both ways yeah. like you might have too much or too little of it you might be ashamed of your authority so it's kind of a work on self that is a real differentiator over the years and then again uh, to the to the software updates we're never done no no 
the work on self is never done. There will always be trigger points. Yeah. Um, but then to own it, to acknowledge. Yeah. The trigger, or to repair. Yeah, the trigger points won't go away, right? But mm. how can you get in relationship with your trigger points? Yeah. So they are less acute and you actually can work with them. We can do things despite them being active or something like this. Is there a thinking tool for that? <laughs> That's the thinking tool for everything. Uh, <laughs> no, but I do, I do have a, I do think self-leadership is so important. Like, what's the first question you ask yourself? I, uh, just to give one example, a lot of people, when they get work, they ask themselves, okay, how long will this take me? A terrible question, because you go straight into maximum delivery. Better That's question. Stress. Yeah, better question is, okay, given all my other things, how much time should I spend on this? And then with the time I have assigned to, what's the best thing I can do? Mm. Like, but it's the yeah. same thing. It's just how do you lead yourself? Yeah. And it's the same with facilitation. True. And this example also makes me think of the Eisenhower matrix. So the, is it urgent? Is it important? Yeah. Where yeah. do I locate it? And hence, how much time do I yeah. allocate? Because every task takes as long as we allocate to it. Yeah. <laughs> Or it's short. And you know, like, But it's asking people to take risks. Yeah. And we need to be mm -hmm. cognizant of this, right? If you ask someone to be pragmatic, sounds good. But in essence, you ask them to take risks. So you need to make it safe for them. You need to make them make the choice. Yes, in this instance, I am pragmatic. And it's worth the risk. And you say that being pragmatic means taking risks because there's always a trade-off. Hmm. And either yeah. or. So being pragmatic means that we have to say no to something in order yeah. to say yes to something else. Yeah. Including sort of level of detail. Mm. And like you can, like, I always find it interesting when people say, this presentation will take me eight hours to do. And I say, okay, what could you do in three hours? <laughs> and so that's asking them to be pragmatic, but it's asking them to take a risk because they know. What can you leave out? What can you, what can you leave out? I will get critical questions. But it might still be worth it. You know, you might get two critical yeah. questions, but two critical questions might be worth five hours. And then <laughs> what comes to my mind is, was it Ernst Hemingway who said, if I've had more time, I would have written a shorter letter? Yeah. Yeah. One of. So then the question, how long will the presentation take you to create? Yeah. Or how long will it take you to create a shorter presentation? So who is actually the bottleneck and whom are you presenting yeah. to? Yeah, right? yeah. Also very interesting because in short time we can just copy and paste all the information we find, but then it's non-curated information. Yeah. I and would, then what do we leave out? What do we yeah. put in? I always find that um, one of my pet things is when people come, I've done 80% of the work, here are 150 slides, all what you need to know is in there. <laughs> That's technically correct, but you haven't put it in a narrative structure and therefore it doesn't mean anything to me. So you, your count is not by 80%, your count is at zero. You're like, and then <laughs> you can, you can give me an imperfect narrative structure or an unfilled, uh, unsort of backed up narrative structure, but you need to give me a narrative structure until, unless I have nothing. Which is interesting because it also connects back to what you said in the beginning about the mental model that you learned yeah. at the consulting yeah. agencies that you have a narrative structure with holes and then you know exactly what questions to ask in order to fill the yeah. gaps yeah. and thereby make it easier. Yeah. For instance, like one thing was always, if your client agrees with you, don't spend any more time on it, mm. which is completely unintuitive, but focus on the issues where there actually is, there are issues. <laughs> yes. And I mean, that, there might be it things. It so comfortable. Yeah, <laughs> of course. Right. And <laughs> yes, you want yes. to be, you want to be complete and all these sorts of things. Yeah. You don't want to expose yourself by doing something pragmatically. And that's where the self-leadership comes in, right? To say, well, that's a risk I take because I want to get home for dinner. Yeah. So there's a whole nother thing about sort of trade-offs between professional and personal life that people sort of aren't aware that they are actually doing. But yeah, it's kind of what I try to do is sort of just capture a certain mindset that I think will be even more important as we go in the future. And not only in organizations, but personally, because then what I get from this conversation and the complexity yeah. is that the thinking tools are also connected to feeling tools and it's for yeah. everyday work on ourselves or a task yeah. yeah, and helping us to give it a concept and being, and maybe that's the crucial point 
to be aware of the complexity hmm. because it all starts with self-awareness of the topic and then we can find the holes yeah. in the narrative and then we can ask the right questions yeah. and look for the right tools yeah thank you that's why i facilitate thinking tools and don't teach them <laughs> wonderful <Yeah>. Boof. <laughs> <laughs> mic dropping moment right? mic dropping moment thank you stefan thank you miriam Thank you for staying tuned and for listening to the show. I know how busy you are, and I appreciate that you're sharing your two most valuable resources with me and my guest, your time and your attention. If you're looking for more conversation with other facilitators and for a community of practice, why don't you join Never Done Before, the community that I have built, and many of my podcast guests are already members. Visit neverdonebefore.org and I wish to see you there.